Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Addressing the nation for the first time after the Article 370 was revoked, Prime Minister Narendra Modi called it the beginning of a new era. In his televised address to the nation, the Prime Minister said that Union Territory status of Jammu and Kashmir is temporary, accusing the contentious Article 370 and 35A of creating the environment of terror and violence in the valley. The Prime Minister added, both these Articles 370 and 35A were used to encourage anti-national sentiments by Pakistan. Because of this, 42,000 innocent people lost their lives, is what he said. Guaranteeing peace and tranquility in the valley, he said that the people in Jammu and Kashmir would not face any difficulty in celebrating Eid. He congratulated the patriotic people of Jammu and Kashmir who stood up against Pakistan's conspiracy of terrorism and separatism. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the Prime Minister's address to the nation. Joining me on the program today are Kaval Sibbal, former Foreign Secretary, Shakti Sinha, Strategic Affairs Expert, and Alok Pansal, Director, India Foundation. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador Sibbal, I'd like to begin the program with you. Your first reaction and your thoughts on the Prime Minister's address to the nation. I found it uh, very thoughtful very well structured, very statesmanlike, uh, very effective speech. Uh, this is the kind of speech that was expected of Prime Minister Modi, who is an excellent orator, who understands the issues in depth. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me bring in the other panelists as well now into the picture. Shakti Sinha, uh, several references the Prime Minister made, uh, dedicated the entire speech to the people of Jammu and Kashmir and also to the people of the country and how they have suffered in the past and that will not be so going forward. Mm -hmm. you know, it was very strong on that. He on one hand referred to the fact that these people who clean, who do the scavenging work, who are protected in the rest of the country, laws in favor of the Dalits, laws against atrocities on Dalits, that has not been applied in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The thousands who have come across to the Indian side of the border after partition, who, who did not fully mention, lived in what is the old Raja's territory, state subjects. They, have, they can vote for the Lok Sabha elections but cannot participate in domestic elections. How this has denied economic prospects of the area. I mean, he brought out, he says, tell me one person who can tell me what good did 370 do to Kashmir. So I think he made out a very, very good case of why breaking out of 370 and 35A is good for the people of the valley, of Jammu and of Ladakh. And he gives specific examples of individuals, Ruksana's case he mentioned, he mentions Aurangzeb's case, Sonam Wangchu's case, hmm. how they did so much to defend the motherland. You know, So I think it, uh, it really brought out very strongly why the old system was just not working. And just because it was there, we should not expect it to live forever. And therefore, we must change. Certainly. Alok Bansal, I'd like to bring you into the picture now. You know, Several references made to Pakistan as well and how Pakistan has used the sentiments of the people of Kashmir, used it against India, really festered terrorism there for years on, but nobody has done anything about it. Now is the time to act. See, there are very many references which a common man in this country did not know. We in Jammu Kashmir Study Centre have tried to bring it to the public notice, but many of these instances were today quoted by Prime Minister. Like the Valmikis who were brought during Maharaja's time, who did not have a right to vote, who were empowered only to work as sanitary workers. They could not be employed anywhere else. Like there are Gurkhas who have come who can only be employed as watchmen. Now the people from West Pakistan who migrated in 47, who can vote in Lok Sabha but cannot vote in Vidhan Sabha and things like that. So there were huge issues which had not uh, which had not been in public knowledge we all knew about the cases inequity which came because of uh, gender disparity where women's children could not inherit a woman who had married outside the state his her children could not inherit but the son who had married outside his children could uh, inherit but there were other issues and what he has said very importantly is that the restructuring of the state opens floodgates of development he's talked about ladakh which should have been the tourist hub of the world, uh, the infrastructure that can develop. He talked about that special harm, the solo, which is actually which is actually a wonder harm, which is being considered by a modern day Sanjeevani by many of the... He, so he brought out specific references and he assured the people of Jammu and Kashmir 
that you will have the right and freedom to choose your representatives independently and then very soon jammu and kashmir as in when the situation normalizes will become a full fledged state mm. uh, as previously so he has tried to assuage the fears that people might have he has wished them for eid he has said that the citizens of the state who are outside uh, can comfortably go back celebrate it with their families and things are normal as they were and what is important is that he has actually told them that 370 and 35a had shackled the potential of growth that this region had and i think now after this speech he also talked to private sector corporate world that they should go and invest there he talked of setting up bpos setting up uh, it companies uh, because please understand the environment itself facilitate certain types of investment tourism of course is there hotels etc are there but solar power he talked of immense potential of solar power uh, and different fields where investment could go on so i think prima facie this address was targeted towards the people of jammu and kashmir towards the people of rest of india and also towards the international community who may have any apprehensions where he said that we are going to this situation condition is going to be normal very soon and this has been done to empower the people to push this particular region on the path of growth and progress all right talking about the international community and pakistan i must ask ambassador ask ambassador sibal this question you know ambassador as far as uh, uh, you know the abrogation of article 370 is concerned does it have any external international or foreign policy related dimensions and if you can take take us through that well you know pakistan will agitate this issue because they will argue that uh, india is violating the un resolutions that they are changing the basis of uh, the uh, entire dispute uh, with uh, with pakistan that they are annexing uh, jammu and kashmir but more than that that by this step Uh, which violates the rights of the kashmiris uh, and arresting them on mass and imposing a curfew they are creating tensions in the region and uh, creating a situation where imran khan said that there could be pulwama type attacks mm. which will then uh, raise the levels of escalation between the two sides from a conventional war to potentially a nuclear uh, conflict and this is the kind of uh, propaganda they are going to make uh, they are, they are going to uh, talk about the, vi the violation of human rights of uh, jammu and kashmir and they'll find some sympathetic uh, uh, echoes of this in the un human rights council which has already issued a couple of uh, uh, statements uh, and reports uh, which are baseless uh, highly prejudiced but uh, which serve the political purposes of uh, this council similarly un secretary general mm -hmm. is already asked for uh, you know restraint on both sides and avoidance of uh, tensions uh, so he he's also uh, will watch the situation and one could expect perhaps even another statement if there is uh, some unrest in in jammu and kashmir but the issue will not come to the un security council for mm -hmm. for more than one reason one of course is that everybody knows that pakistan has been playing mischief not only in jammu and kashmir but also in afghanistan that their hands are tainted with terrorism the fatf the financial action task force has given them a list of a whole lot of things that they need to do to uproot the structures of terrorism in their country and they're not being able to comply with that they need desperately bailouts from the imf etc etc and of course they're under pressure from the united states on the whole issue of afghanistan which involves also uh, restraining the taliban so right uh the the un security council will not intervene in this issue will and this will be another step a snub to imran khan uh, which will which will be seen as a defeat of the government by its own public hmm. uh, and now of course they are trying to raise tensions by taking all these steps as sent, sending our ambassador back stopping all trade this and that in order to give the impression to the international community that the situation is deteriorating and needs their intervention especially that of the united states but this is a game that they have played so often in the past that the international community is not going to fall for it and what is most important and i think the modi government needs to be particularly praised for this is the diplomatic efforts in the gulf countries 
where a country like UAE has mm-hmm. called this an internal matter, the OAC contact group on Kashmir where Turkey is a big mischief maker, they may say something, but the OIC is not going to back Pakistan to the extent that they think uh, that uh, they would. So all in all, it's a resounding uh, diplomatic, political uh, defeat for Pakistan, and they're totally frustrated, and they really don't know what to do except to try and raise tensions and scare the international community. All right. So considering what the ambassador has just said, I'll just come to you mm-hmm. in just, just a bit, Shakti Sinha. Look, Mansal, should we be concerned on the border? Should we be extra vigilant, really? Is Pakistan going to try some misadventure on the border? See, we need to understand what is happening in Pakistan. And uh, Pakistan, there was a sense of euphoria some time back when Imran Khan went to U.S. And they thought when President Trump talked of mediation and when U.S. talked of getting Taliban onto negotiating table, they thought their fortunes had turned around. And they had again come center stage. And they thought that U.S. would be dependent on them. And uh, they thought it will be hunky-dory like before. And they started... uh, Mm, indulging in all sorts of things. But when this happened, 370 and 35A, and they saw that US talked of it as an internal affair, then IMF came up with a statement saying that if FATF actually keeps you in the list, you will not be able to pay the loans. Then Chinese loan also $8.5 billion came under question mark. And then when UAE said that this is an internal matter, all the neighboring countries Uh, supported India's stance, Pakistan didn't know what hit them. And there was a huge problem. The opposition in Pakistan itself started saying that you have been claiming a lot of things, but nothing is going to happen. Modi has devoured Kashmir. That's the term they used. And then they didn't know what to do. So they had to do certain pretense of doing something. That was firstly for the domestic audience, because sending back high commissioners makes... No difference as far as this is concerned. The trade between India and Pakistan, direct trade, was already minuscule. It had already come down after Pulwama and things like that because we had denied them MFN status. We had clamped 200% duty and things like that. So, bulk of the trade between India and Pakistan as it is takes place through third, uh, third country, either through Dubai, UAE or through Afghanistan. It goes to Afghanistan and gets back into Pakistan. So it makes no difference. By snapping trade, Pakistan has actually dug its own grave because please understand the most significant industrial output from Pakistan is textiles. 65% of Pakistan's industrial labor force is employed in textile industry. Bulk of it uses cotton that is imported from India. Now, if you actually uh, break uh, trade relations, there will be no cotton. If there is no cotton, then the textile industry gets affected. Similarly, there is also a desperation. They thought that by saying that diplomatic relations are snapped, probably international community will feel that the tensions have arisen. And Pakistan has always been trying to say that tensions between two nuclear part neighbors is actually uh, a cause for concern for the global community. So that is what Pakistan is trying. You may see a little bit of escalation, but the government of India has managed wonderfully well. They have actually secured the line of control, the international border, the security forces have been in full alert and within the valley also they have clamped down. None of the uh, terrorists have been given a free run. Those who infiltrated etc. most of them have been liquidated. Mm. The leadership of the anti-national elements has also been liquidated. So while there is fear, in fact, not only in Jammu and Kashmir but in the entire country, there has to be a certain level of security threat for some days to come. Mm. Mm. But we all have to be vigilant and uh, we need to defeat this. But Pakistan is going through a problem. The day uh, this problem happened, you saw in Islamabad, banners were unfurled which talked of Akhand Bharat. Right. And they remained from 4.30 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon. Mm, mm. And today Islamabad authorities are saying who has done it, who has done it. They are trying to apprehend the culprits. They have right. not been able to uh, get a uh, finger as to who has done it. Now, this sort of thing happening in the capital of Pakistan shows where the problem in Pakistan are. Right, absolutely. You know, and uh, is Pakistan, Shakti Sina, mm-hmm. trying to build a false nar- narrative really for the world so that it's hoping against hope that someone is going to intervene at some point in yeah. time? You see, the, uh, Pakistan's whole attempt has been to try and what they say, internationalize the Kashmir issue. It's, we, there's an old saying about Pakistan that they always negotiate with the world with a gun pointed at their own head. Saying that if you don't help me, I'll shoot myself. I'll shoot myself, then it'll be a big trouble for all of you, you know. 
So that is the kind of a game which people, the nuclear bluff. People have now seen through it. People feel that, okay, fine, we understand your problem. And therefore, the kind of support that they wanted to get or the kind of fear they wanted to create, they simply are not creating that fear. I mean, as Alok Sohar actually pointed out, what do they need to stop the Samjhauta Express? We were clear, we are confident that our trains will go to Lahore, will come back, we are not afraid of them. They said, no, we'll stop the train. High Commissioner, what does it, how does it matter in this day and age? So, you know, this kind of uh, fear psychosis that they're creating within the country and to the world outside, we're about to go to war. The two, why would you go to war over a change of the legal status of Jammu Kashmir when Pakistan has never recognized the accession of Jammu Kashmir to India? If you do not recognize the instrument of accession, you do not recognize Article 370, why should it bother you what does India do with Article 370? That's a logical question. It's none of your business. Because you yourself say it's none of your business, right? So this kind of game that they are playing, and they're playing this game at a time when USA and China have trade disputes, which are not going away, which are actually going up. Japan and South Korea have had disputes. Russian planes have entered South Korean airspace. The Iran issue is actually ramping up. England and Europe are stuck on Brexit. All kinds of things are happening. Turkey is fighting with USA on their S-400 Air Force, whatever it is. And that kind of things happening in the world, do you really think the world will really worry about Jammu Kashmir being... So I think Pakistan has put itself into a corner where they really have nowhere to go, except, and this is where the fear is there, and you, in the previous question you pointed it out, except the fear that they will slightly create situations on the border, or as Imran Khan tells the Pakistani parliament, There'll be Fulwama types attack. So you're telling the world, I will have a terrorist attack in India unless you stop me. Mm. Excuse me. So, you know, that is desperation. That's sad, but that could be dangerous. So we have to be extra vigilant. Airports, public places, we have to learn to cope with certain inconveniences to prevent these things happening. Absolutely. And India is not the same India of 20 years ago. So we're not going to allow any of that to happen in, uh, you know, on our soil. So let's hope that none of that happens in the near future. All right. Ambassador Sibal, you know, as far as uh, India is concerned, India has asked Pakistan really to review its decision as far as downgrading diplomatic ties are concerned. But uh, if that doesn't happen, what's likely to happen next? What should we do? Well, actually, whatever the steps they have taken uh, act, don't, uh, don't really hurt us. Uh, they are self-inflicted wounds uh, by Pakistan. Uh, the ambassadors uh, are not engaged in any serious uh, political dialogue between the two countries. They are there in a representational function. Uh, so if the ambassadors are withdrawn, it's not going to affect very much the uh, the conversations between between the two countries. Uh, number two, uh, on the trade, as has been rightly pointed out, uh, they are going to suffer, uh, not us, because the trade is very, very little. Uh, and for Pakistan, exchequer, uh, it will be an additional burden because they'll have to in, import the goods they get from India through third parties at a higher price. Uh, some Jota Express will inconvenience uh, divided Muslim families but not the public at large, and it, and it alienates some sections of the Muslim community, both in Pakistan and in India, and that also will go to the disadvantage uh, of uh, Pakistan. Uh, some other gestures that they are making about uh, August 14 and this and that, that is immaterial. Actually, they have no good choices. They have been cornered. They have been, uh, and the frustration is expressing itself in some of the actions they have taken. Now, what one should not totally exclude is the fact that uh, there are in deeply entrenched uh, elements in Jammu and Kashmir uh, who have been involved in violence uh, sponsored by Pakistan uh, and uh, they have uh, got used uh, to, a, to a situation uh, where either it's stone pelting or terrorist attacks or whatever. Uh, and now they find that uh, with the new approach of the government of India and the very comprehensive approach of uh, reorganizing the social fabric of Kashmir, the power base of these elements and all the privileges that they enjoy, the political blackmail that they engaged in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government of India, the corruption and the money they amassed through corruption, 
the, the Islamic agenda that they had, that is going, uh, to be, going to be undermined altogether. So there will be some resistance. And that is what we have to be watchful about. Because, and Pakistan would deeply want this, that if there is some, uh, some the street, street violence, if the security forces in, intervene, there is some, some uh, police action, then they can raise this issue of, uh, of human rights violations mm -hmm. and etc., uh, etc. Et sure. But other than this, I think uh, these forces have been marginalized. Pakistan has been marginalized. And very importantly, and I want to make this point, right. there is no, and I'm very happy about it, there is no scope left for any dialogue with Pakistan, any comprehensive dialogue with Pakistan, or putting Kashmir on the agenda of our bilateral talks whenever it happens mm. as an unfinished, as an outstanding issue. Right. There is no outstanding issue left. So there is no need for a back channel. Okay. So this is very good. And this will also defang the, the lobbies in India who have been uh, talking about dialogue, engaging Imran Khan, testing out whether he wants to peace. Now, Imran Khan has also exposed himself. If he was really genuinely wedded to a dialogue and peace with India, then why should he take these steps that he has taken? After all, by amending the constitution, we are not committing aggression against Pakistan. We are not sending our armed forces there. We are mm -hmm. not promoting terrorism there. And it does not stop them from keeping on claiming that, uh, that, that Kashmir is a disputed territory, it's an international dispute, etc. Et so they, they can continue to say that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. So, so, th so closing there, comments from my, they from my no other panelists as well. Uh, yeah, I've got limited time on the program. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Ambassador Sibal. You know, Alok Bansal, uh, you know, the Prime Minister spoke about getting rid of terror and separatism in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, how easy or difficult a task is that going to be, considering what the Ambassador has just said about how these sentiments are entrenched in some of the people in Jammu and Kashmir? See, the people who have the sentiments entrenched are a very, very small number. But what the government has to be guard against is that we have well begun. But we need to continue. The, the visible change must be seen as soon as possible. So there must be certain steps which actually generate employment, like government has taken, metro has been fast-tracked, and certain engineers have been provided. But to my mind, the beginning will not be done by the corporate sector, because corporate se sector by nature is cautious. It mm. might invest in Ladakh, but in JNK, you may not see corporate sector come immediately and invest. So government will have to take an initiative. To that extent, I feel construction will be the key. And to that extent, we need to set up a few new urban centers in Jammu and Kashmir. And one of the things that we can start is that Jammu and Kashmir spends 150 crores every year in shifting of capital from Jammu to Srinagar and back. Besides DA, there is a one set of infrastructure which lies idle at any given time, either in Jammu or in Srinagar. A time has come, like Sydney and Melbourne, we need to create a new capital midway between Jammu and Srinagar, which is climatically planned, which is well connected and is a permanent structure. That is where we can set up habitation for Kashmiri Pandits. We can set up a planned city, which is far more secure, far more habitable and this sort of uh, superfluous expenditure that takes place on as, um, pandering to people's regional aspirations by shifting it from Jammu and Srinagar. Both the cities which are bursting at seams will get over. So that will be one way where you can trigger heavy investment and construction and where you can actually trigger employment. Right. You need to create certain more urban conglomerates. Sure. Probably one on Mughal Road, one between Leh and Kargil where a new administrative setup for Ladakh could come up mm -hmm. and one between Leh and Manali. That could be the beginning. And then you need to create special economic zones where corporates can be drawn. They may sure. have to be incentivized for them to invest there. Probably something will have to be done, but we need to make a change immediately visible. So sure. in next two months, some change must be visible that yes, this restructuring has resulted in a change and which a common man should be able to feel. And that is how you will actually defang these separatists, defang these entrenched vested interests, which have been uh, creating this anti-India sentiment and uh, have getting their bread yeah, and absolutely. actually been... Uh, making a meal out of it. Sure, sure. Shakti Sana, close the show for us with the concluding remarks on the best way forward. See, the best way forward, one is the long-term developments are very required. One good thing which has happened in the last few months of governor's rule is this crackdown on corruption. This has been warmly welcomed across the board. 
then improvement in electricity supply, making roads better. These are things you can achieve in two, three months' time. Because people also want to, and side by side, yes, there are sections of society who have thrived on insecurity, have thrived on Algawad and Atankawad, as the PM said. You have to control them while separating them from the common people. The common person must feel wanted, looked after, justice is done. That kind of a feeling to get through will in the short term really help. And then you move toward the longer term developments of the sort Alok mentioned. Some of them are difficult to do, but initially it is the government which has to take the lead, come across as a caring government, but an efficient government. What is the point of caring if you can't deliver? Right. Derby electricity, roads, water supply, improve public services, the hospitals. I mean, these are things you can do relatively fast to show that, yes, we mean business. Right. We'll wish you all the best. All right. On that note, then, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.